I was going to share with you what I got from Morgan for our anniversary. Oh. Yeah, don't put it, don't put it up yet. Well, I'm not. No, no, that's going to be. Uh, no, no, Brian, I can't. Yeah, I use that with uh, Roger. Yeah, I really like it. We, we did Skype last night for our League of Liberty thing, mm -hmm. and it sounds pretty good, but Ringer, I think, has just lower latency, so it sounds a little bit better. Um, you get some more water while you're getting washed up. Thanks, All right. Southport water station? Uh, yeah, and there's water in the fridge. Oh, no. The tap is fine-ish. Oh, Galt, I don't know why keto hasn't worked for me. Um, let me see if I can resume this call. Uh, we're not using a Google product, so it should work. I am. Bittner is a Google product. Um, let me try. My one plus five. He did say, yes, that's right, Galt. You heard him right. The tap water is fine, is what Bittner said. Not only is he keto, he's fluoride. Oh, oh Galt. Galt's a very sweet boy. Very crazy boy, but very sweet. Well, I figure the amount of fluoride that's in this isn't going to be enough to... Now, is that non-sweet tea? This is water, dude. Oh, from Chick-fil-A? Yeah. What? Yeah. What'd you eat? Uh, I had nuggets because I was in a, I was in a hurry. Right. So I didn't do my normal salad. Yes, the hat is back. I, I almost put on my USA hat, but it looked weird, so. You can borrow my dog's hat if you want. <laughs> Why do you have a hat for your dog? No. Oh, dogs, like... Yes. Georgia Bulldogs, okay. Yes. I was like, why are you carrying your pug's hat around? <laughs> no, Saturday's game day. <laughs> Saturday is also for the boys. Saturday is game day. That's the only thing that matters on Saturday. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Let's see here. That feels racist. Well, that's only because you heard racism in it, Brett. Little, mm -hmm. bit, little Brett Bittner from the South. Uh, yes, the beard is a little itchy today, but I'm getting used to it. Uh, as, I, as you know, I'm a hat guy. I wore, um, I found Carhartt pants with flannel lining, and it's like wearing sweatpants on the inside, but you look professional on the outside. And then I had my Carhartt jacket, like shirt jacket, which is flannel line, so it's very warm and comfy today. And I had boots on because we were going to a construction site for a video shoot. And uh, then there were real construction workers there. <laughs> Did they laugh you out of the room? They they had to have been talking behind my back because I spent ten years on construction sites doing construction cleanups, and like my boots were legit legitimately all torn up, and my pants were all ripped, and my you know. I was a mess, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was... It and you go, oh, this is what real men are like. This is not us. They know how to put on a tool belt. You had to have somebody come around behind you and yes. put the tool belt on. Oh, no, we, we had to have somebody put the belt on because we didn't know how. So are these... Give me your wire. Maybe your own. Uh -huh. Okay. That's my wire. Okay. Check, 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 check. Nope. Oh, I heard something. Okay, Ooh. well. That pop was loud. I don't know what Brian Nichols is doing. Hello, 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 hello. Check nope. one, two. I hear cracks, but I don't hear. Okay. I mean, I can hear you just fine. I'm just, when he gets here, I... 
I don't you know. can hear me talking in the mic. No, I can hear you just because we're in the same room together. Okay. I can't hear anything at all on here. Well, that's a problem. I blame Harry. Well, a lot of our problems can be blamed on Harry. Good. Call. Why can you not hear anything? Choo 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 choo. Huh. I'm glad I didn't hear that in stereo. Did you, did you hear it pop? Yes. Alright. So, and the buzz. Alright, so we're plugged in, and there is noise coming out of the main. Heard a crack? Heard some buzz. Okay, check one, two, check, 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 check. Nope. Check, 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 check. Well, this is an outrage. Oh, blame Harry. Yep, check, 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 check. check. All right, something's, I hear it, fuzzy. All right. Not for me. Okay, no. so see if you can follow this cord for me. Down and see where it's plugged in at. It's plugged in right here. Is it plugged in on the way? Yep. Alright. Um, let's see. Can you unplug it? Mm -hmm. Unplug it for 10 seconds and plug it back in. that and I heard that. Check, check, check. Nope. You can hear me fuzz. Oh. Did you hear it all the way or just a fuzz? I heard the fuzz. Okay. And just in my left ear. Hello? Oh yeah, I can hear that. Alright. Yep. Um Log out. Let's restart. Well, this is fan fucking tastic. I knew it was Harry's fault. Alright. Bum. 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 There shouldn't be dueling Thursday shows, by the way. I think if you're watching the other show, which I will not mention, please let them know that I am displeased that their live stream is working and mine is not. Yep, I see them right now. Yep. All seven seven viewers. Chris Galt. Mm -hmm. All right, so now, why are we? That is off or on. Um, check one, two, check, check, check. So, here, sound, input, input, okay, why can't we do that? 
do, 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 do. Hello? Brian? Hey, I can there hear There we go. All that right. Could. Could, yeah. All right, buddy. How are you? Yep, how are you? Good. Uh, Brian, it's so nice to talk to you. How, how have things been? Yep, and we are live streaming to our group, so don't say it. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. Kayfabe, all right? Kayfabe. Kayfabe. All right, here we go. Let's get started. Let's jump right into it. Whip. Oops. Oh. Why, what, did you just turn on the fan? Yeah, there, there it goes. Hold on. All right. Is that better, Christy? Talk for me, Brian. Keep going. How is... How... Yeah, that's one of the things about weight loss is that <laughs> you get cold. Yes, you do. Very cold. Uh, now, let's just keep let's keep talking until we can make sure that we get you on to. So, uh, Brian, how much weight have you lost? See if we can hear him on the screen. Right. Uh, I did go through some injuries though in the past year with my shoulder. Uh, so my my personal records for my uh, shoulder press and such uh, those are gone, unfortunately. Go Days of the past, cool. but the past hey, no, good. even still, it's uh, it's one of those things. Pretty fun to uh, see the change. Well, we're proud of you. All right, here we go. We oh, are thanks, we, Chris. We are ready. We are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber on Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. So in exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. This show is a crowd is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag, ugh, the hashtag WAL News, or in our Facebook group or Discord channel. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians dot com. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. In this show, we will uh, cover. The Niger uh, happenings and our global reach across the world in, in terms of our military. Uh, we may touch on some of the president's phone calls to the, uh, the family of war dead, but that's far, far less important than what's happening in the, uh, in the African continent right now. But first, let me introduce my co-host for this evening. First... It is Never Bittner. Lil Brett Bittner, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Chris. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's uh, so 
Sad to see you on the show. Oh, isn't it always, though? You know, I actually heard that you had accidental fun with me on Saturday. I did. I accidentally, and let me bring in our other co-host, Brian Nichols, live from Philadelphia, the cradle of freedom. How are you, Brian? I'm doing good, and, and I want to throw in that's what she said joke so badly, but the opportunity didn't present itself. Yes. Organically. I'm good. So, Brian, I had a fun time with Brett Bittner and his lovely girlfriend, Morgan, on Saturday night, and my, my date, Michelle. And uh, She's lovely, by the way. She's a fantastic person, good friend, and uh, I have to say, <laughs> I'm ashamed of myself because I almost enjoyed spending time with Brett Bittner. It's been known to happen. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know Brett personally, but Brett, you, you've been through a hell of a of a journey yourself physically, right? Uh, quite a bit, yeah. In, in fact, tomorrow is uh, T2D Day. It's mm -hmm. uh, the day, the anniversary of the day that I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Right. And so I'm going to eat and drink all of the terrible things. Wow. Uh, now, you basically don't have diabetes <laughs> at this point, right? Uh, so the doctor will not tell me that, but I'm off of all meds. My blood sugar is normal for non-diabetic, and I've lost 75 pounds. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, you look And awesome. I'm drinking water. There was a video of of you at a Gary Johnson event uh, late last year, and I was watching it. It was like, holy cow, Bittner was fat. Is that when we were down at uh, IU? At Purdue. Or was it IU? Wait, well. I think it was Purdue. It was this Gary the Gary Johnson. Up, yeah, it was yeah. Mitch Daniels. Okay, yeah, yeah, the Mitch Daniels one. And then we had the OAI thing at IU that was later in the right. later in the fall. Yeah, and I saw that video. It came up in the you know the the memories on Facebook, and I was like, "Wow, I who? Oh, that's me." Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and for my part, I've lost three pounds. This it's always year. fun when you go back and you see the pictures of yourself. It's amazing. Oh yeah. Brian used to be a huge fat guy too. Yeah, I, I was three eighty at my heaviest. Um, got down to. About 204 at my lightest, um, and then I started doing weightlifting. So now I'm at a uh, a comfortable 265. Um, but yeah, I know I, I can I can totally empathize, but I mean it's it's a hell of a battle trying to, to you know lose the weight. It, you know it's it's one of those things that's every single day. There's never an easy day. Um, so you know kudos to you, man, for doing what you did. I, I I know how hard it is, and you know that's something that you can't ever ever pass up in terms of uh, singing praise. Well, well, thanks a bunch. And actually, the weight loss was uh, just kind of a side effect. Right. It was all about getting my blood sugar under control, and it is for the most part. So as long as I don't eat anything crazy all the time, I'm oh, in awesome. pretty good shape. And maybe we'll maybe we'll have a Spangle intervention later on the in the show. But for now, let's jump into the main topic of the week. On October fourth, we lost four service members in in the Green Berets, and they were in a company in a country called Niger. And uh, I think everybody on Donald Trump's team gets real nervous when he starts talking about this country. Um, and these three Green Berets uh, were training soldiers in Niger, which – all right. So Niger is in – 80 percent of the country is the Sahara Desert. And most of the 20 million people that live in the country live down in the southern portion on the border with Nigeria – and Nigeria is a country of 200 million people, so it's much bigger, much more diverse, much more wealthy, whereas Niger is landlocked and very poor, and the majority of its citizens live in destitution, essentially. There's very few resources, almost no ability to grow food. They're almost completely dependent on what is given to them. So they're a very poverty-stricken country. Out of 193 nations, they're 188 on the list of countries that uh, are have human development in what's called the Human de human Development Index. And so Nigerians are a very poor country, yet they have a government that is, uh, and as a result, they have an unstable government, as a lot of African governments are, but they are very committed to fighting terrorism because they are a country that... Uh, is swarmed with them because you have an an unstable country uh, that is on the border of Libya and Chad and um, Nigeria in the south and also um, Mal I can never say it Mali uh, 
on the on the other side and so <laughs> it's it's very much a transient country for many of the um islamic islamic fighters like boko haram which is very active in nigeria uh al qaeda uh some isis and so and they are moving through the country all of the time and you're going to hear a lot more about uh this area of the uh i wish i i saw the word i never heard the word before but it's basically the sudanese belt and it's a different term now but stretches that that right before it goes into the horn of africa sahel uh it's called the sahel region of africa it is right at the bottom of the saharan desert is called the sahel region and that whole region stretching from the sudan in the east to the atlantic in the west is a hotbed of terrorist activity and I don't think a lot of us, including many senators, knew that there was a lot going on in that region. Right. It was it was interesting to see uh, Lindsey Graham and John McCain talking about it. And I believe Lindsey Graham was even surprised that we had troops that were there. And that was one of the questions that he was asking was, wow, I didn't even know we were there. We have 800. And Rand Paul gave him shit for it, too. Right. As well, he should, because he's one of the most interventionist uh, <laughs> senators that we have. Um, and for him to not know. Uh, that we have troops in 53 of the 54 African nations, uh, which was confirmed uh, last week by the uh, Joint Chiefs. Um, and I, I had no idea that we had that many troops. Granted, it's only 6,000 uh, people, but they're spread across the entire continent in 53 of the 54 only. nations there. Only 53 of the 54. So there's one really lucky African nation. So, yeah, we have uh, 800, tr <laughs> 800 troops currently in uh, Niger, and we have um, – we are building a $100 million base there for drones to participate in drone strikes. Of course. In that entire region. And so what happens with a lot of no. these countries is that when you have a poor country like Niger, uh, they – they <laughs> – anyways, uh, sorry – I was thinking, eh, I'm going to censor myself. Um, <laughs> there, when you have a poor country like this, essentially, you have um, – they they walk into American embassies, and this actually happened in Nigeria's case – or Niger's case, where the president walked into the American embassy and said, can you help make us a democracy in the, in the early 90s? And uh, part of what makes them a democracy in terms of the – in the Americans' eyes is they let them build bases there. And so a lot of these countries, in exchange for um, you know, assistance, we get to put a base in their country, which is why we're in – what is it, 172 countries that the New York Times reported this week? I believe it's 172 with uh, – it's over 9,000 bases. 9,000 bases across the world. What did you say, Brian? It's it's something stupid like that. I mean, it, the the number of countries we're in right now, you'd think we're at war with the entire world, um, just because we are literally in every single continent. Well, um, obviously, which, you are. They, it, it's just are. it's mind blowing to think that we have that much of a military presence, and we have not yet formally declared a war since 1945. I mean, literally, the entire um, reason that we are able to even have a presence right now in Niger is because they're still utilizing. The, uh, the 2001 uh, War Powers Act that was enacted um, based on the 9-11 attacks. Um, so, I mean, basically, we're in a forever war. And it's just it's absolutely insane that this authorization of military force. Wherever they want to, without any congressional oversight, as per the Constitution has, you know, that's the entire role of the Constitution to declare war. Um, through the use of congressional means. So I'm just, I'm livid. I mean, I hear so many of these GOP, uh, you know, rah, rah, go team, go team America guys out there saying, this is great. You know, we got to establish our, our American dominance. It's like, no, that's that's entirely the opposite of what the constitution was set up to to allow to happen. So yeah, it just, I, I'm, I'm pretty uh, pissed off about it. But Brian, didn't you hear John McCain talk about how this is a, this is a, a threat that knows no boundaries and we have to just, <laughs> follow them wherever they go and there's there's you know we have to take them to the edge of the earth uh, 
the flat earthers, I'm sure, are <laughs> are very excited that we're talking about following these terrorists to the edge of the earth because maybe we'll actually find where the earth ends. Yeah, so here's let me give a couple more facts that kind of shape this because I think in terms of the geopolitics of this region, we've got uh, a couple more things that we need to insert into the discussion before we really jump into analysis. analysis. Um a lot of the region, the reason that this stage, that this is now a destabilized region, is that the American government overthrew or allowed the overthrow of and encouraged the overthrow in Libya of Muammar Gaddafi, and Gaddafi had a large, large Correct. store of not only gold, hard assets, but also weapons, and so in 2013, when Benghazi happened and then Gaddafi fell. You ended up having a massive amount of weapons start to flood into the rest of Africa as people came in, stole those weapons, and then fled to places like Mali, uh, Niger, Chad, Somalia, up into the Syrian conflict. And you had this profligation of weapons throughout the entire region from from Libya. And that that combined with the Russians and the Americans arming rebel groups uh, through the Arab Spring and the Syrian conflict and the Iraqi conflict against ISIS. You have uh, ISIS fighters driving brand new Toyota trucks in Syria because of Americans sending Syrian rebels brand new Toyota trucks and then they switch allegiances. And uh, the fight against ISIS has has ISIS is really on the run. They've lost Raqqa. They they just made some uh gains in Kurdish territories, but that's because the Iraqi military forces turned against the Kurdish forces after voting uh to separate from any country and create their own country, which both Turkey and Iran desperately opposed. The Iraqis opposed it. They held a referendum and that pissed everybody off. <laughs> and so so ISIS found a temporary home in the in the Kurdish region uh, currently, and so you have uh, ISIS shrinking, and now because of Iran's help, uh, you have ISIS has shrunk in influence in Middle East, in Syria, and Iraq, and Iran now is poised to take over that entire region from Beirut all the way over to uh, to. Iran, and you now have Iranian dominance in that entire peninsula. So you have the Americans go in to Iraq, overthrow Iraq to try and create a democracy, and end up with what they claim is one of the axis of evil taking over all of Iraq at this point. And <laughs> the Iraqi government currently is a government influenced by Iranian forces, or by uh, the Iranian government. And Syria is soon to follow, as is a lot of the different region. And that sets up a com that sets up a competition, an unhealthy competition, if we know anything about the Middle East, between the Saudis and the Iranians on their doorstep. And Israel this week fired weapons, or fired ordnance into Syria, because they understand that there is a coming war between them and the Iranians. And America may be drug into another Middle Eastern war at the at the leash of the Israelis. Because we destabilized Syria, Libya, and Iraq, and what we did is we f we drew, we forced all of those Islamic extremists down into Africa, and have now destabilized that entire region. And so we are shifting our uh, we're not shifting, we're expanding from Afghanistan, which we have not left, Iraq, which we have not left, Libya which we have not left, Syria, which we have not left, and now we're expanding into these African countries. And so the, the question for, for you guys, and we'll start with Brett, uh, is what – the neocons argue that it is important. Somebody like a John McCain or a Lindsey Graham argues that it is important for us to have influence over the world and to – have these smaller wars in locations like Niger with six uh, soldiers training. And this was all set up. I guess we should actually give you the story to give you the details of the story. 
Um, we we had what we do is we have trainers, we have special advisors, we have Green Berets, Navy SEALs. Oh, kind of like what we did in uh, southern Vietnam. In southern Vietnam, yeah. and that's that's a great point, and that's exactly what happens. It happened in Iraq. It happened. It's happened all over the world. What we do as the American military uh, programs expand, it happened in Panama and other places in in Colombia. There isn't a country on earth where we haven't sent military advisors to help locals. And what the thinking is is you train the locals to do all the heavy lifting of the fighting, and you just give them your knowledge. But the problem is that knowledge, as in the case of the Mujahideen in the 80s in Charlie Wilson's war, as the Mujahideen fought the USSR in Afghanistan, they take your weapons and their training and eventually use it against you, as Saddam Hussein did as well, as the Iranians did. Uh, there are some success stories like Colombia where you have uh, foreign, you help the government fight back the narco traffickers. But those are few and far between. And so we have these military advisors who are there to just help train, right? Because when you see it in the media, you go, oh, that's just training exercises. Well, what you had were uh, several Green Berets. Four were killed in action, as well as six Nigerian soldiers went out on a patrol. And this is a patrol that they had done 28 times previously. And they think that this is part of why they were attacked, is that they got lazy about it because they didn't think that there was uh, very much uh, danger, and they went out on a patrol. Somehow the mission shifted from a patrol to a manhunt for a particular leader in the area, and that ended up with them getting uh, hung up uh, by one villager in this one area who held them, and as they were leaving the village, heading back to their Humvees, they were attacked by 50 Al-Qaeda, and uh, were ambushed. They fought them. They only had rifles. They fought them. Uh, finally called for help about an hour later. 30 minutes after that, the French, who uh, have 4,000 troops in the country, are flew overhead to scare them off, but did not drop ordnance because they didn't have permission. Which, let's also go back in history. This is a former French colony. That mm -hmm. border between Nigeria and Niger was drawn by the French and the British, and it was a made-up line. And so in this entire region, you have a very fluid border. You have very porous borders because to them it's not – the, the countries don't matter to them. Borders don't matter to the tribal people in the, in the area. And so the French are still there dealing with their colonial issues, which should be a lesson for us, and uh, didn't feel that they had a permission to drop bombs to save American soldiers, which I'm like – what are the Nigerians going to do to us? Right. <laughs> you know, like, what are they going to do? Scold us? Um, <laughs> save, save some lives. So, so what we do as a country is we send in these training missions. They, they eventually morph over time and we have these smaller wars to prevent bigger wars. But the problem with that theory, Brett is what? Well, that we're at war number one, and that we're essentially driving out the bad guy to somewhere else where they can come back, they can regroup, they can recruit more, and then they take the they br they bring the war on another front, um, and it's a cycle that we continue to see over and over and over again, where we're supposedly in these smaller wars to save ourselves from the bigger wars, uh, but what we end up doing is we continue to expand on all of the fronts that we are currently in to even more fronts. So that we're spread, um, despite being the largest military power in the world and despite spending <clears throat> ten times as much as the next nine countries combined, um, we end up spreading ourselves too thin and completely ineffective. And so it's a never-ending issue like we've seen in Afghanistan for the last 16 years, like we've seen in Iraq since 2003, um, and even before that when we were in Iraq the first time. Uh, so for us, what we end up doing is we end up hurting ourselves by by fighting these, quote, smaller wars to prevent the bigger wars, where what we end up doing is we end up making so many fronts that we can't keep them all straight. And as many of the listeners, I'm sure, were shocked when we started hearing about all the stuff happening in Niger was we had troops there. I, I was certainly in the same uh, boat as Lindsey Graham and that 
that we had that we had troops there. Right. Brian, go ahead. I mean, yeah. So I mean, one thing that, that Brett brings up, and it kind of leads to another thing that needs to be discovered and explored, is why do we have people who are we're going to war with in the first place? And I think if anything, the and Chris, you brought up Charlie Wilson's war, the uh, Mujahideen, uh, that was the precursor to what was the Taliban uh, in Al Qaeda, who we ended up um, having to to face not only in the um, the war and the or the attack on USS Cole, but also uh, with the attacks, uh, you know, the, the attacks on 9/11, is that we when we keep on expanding our military presence to all these areas that we do not belong. We, we start this process of, uh, of establishing this hatred towards America. And, and Ron Paul, you know, very boldly and bravely back in 2008, um, you know, did the, uh, the debate versus uh, it was with at that time uh, the mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani, um, you know, just seven years removed from 9-11. And, and he basically called out the United States uh, foreign policy uh, of neoconservatism going out and building these new nations with the idea of spreading liberty, air quotes, um, in that – it, it doesn't help us. It actually it fosters this hatred uh, of you know, the United States. In all these tiny little countries uh, with no real uh, mission in mind, no real. So. Entirety of the Middle East, if we will, government. United States as a whole, just because we don't know where to to, to pull back and say, okay, let's mind our own P's and Q's and deal with our own issues at home, versus trying to to fix air quotes every single person's and country's issues that are out there because we feel that. We, we have that responsibility. I mean, I am no fan by any means of the United Nations. But if there is a role for the United Nations, which many will argue there is, um, this is the role to, 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 to be the, the quote-unquote policeman of the world. It's not our job. It, it, and not only can we not afford it through economics, but we can't afford it in terms of the, the livelihoods of Americans who are putting on the line for other individuals you know, halfway across the world that – we we shouldn't have any uh you know any chips in the game to, to determine if they are doing well or not. So uh, I mean more or less if I could summarize it in, in one sentence, it'd be the entire issue we're facing right now is that we have expanded far beyond the scope of what should be the United States goal as a an international powerhouse. We should uh, make sure that we're focusing on America first to t- take from Trump. Instead of doing these these little proxy wars and you know hundred troops here, hundred troops there, to to spread our influence and, and create so much more turmoil going forward than that's necessary. Yeah, that's well. Here's the problem with the UN argument: is where does the money come from and where do the troops come from when you have these UN actions? I mean, it is it is largely funded. Well, that's the problem by is that America. The, the UN, the UN. Yeah, well, the UN, yeah, and that's the problem. Is the UN should not be just the the uh, de facto arm of the United States going forward. It should truly be if, and, and this is not an argument for the UN, but if we're going to have a United Nations, then it should be the United Nations that truly represents the 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 world as a whole as a quote unquote governing body. And I I am not a fan of the United Nations, but if we're going to have a world. Where the United Nations is this this overarching uh, you know global government, the globalists, then then let it do those kind of globalist agendas where it's trying to build peace or stop uh, you know tyrants from taking over certain areas. We can't afford again both in terms of, of dollars and cents, but also human livelihood as Americans to go out and try to be the the strong arm of the UN. It just it doesn't make sense. Number one, but number two. It, it's not our responsibility. It, it really shouldn't be. If we have the UN, then use it as it should be utilized. But would you say, Brian and, and Bittner, you can weigh in on this too, that if we say this should be the UN's responsibility, aren't we saying that there is a problem that needs to be solved? And a neocon would argue back to you, a neocon someone who has a 
neoconservative foreign policy, somebody that believes in interventionism around the world, that America is uh, having our military in the rest of the world create stability, not only in the world, but for our currency, which allows us to be the monetary leader of the world, which brings America the wealth that it has. Uh, which can be, so, a, which can I'm be making, a compelling. I'm a, yes, but I'm which, making a hypothetical based on the sure. uh, the idea that we have the UN. I mean, and right now we we have the UN. I don't agree with it, but if we're going to look at what the UN represents, it is supposed to be that that governing body that is supposed to help keep all the nations in check to avoid a world war in the future, um, but to really to help mediate these issues going forward. Now, I'm not saying that there's an issue in in Niger that should be addressed not only by the United States but by the UN. But I'm saying if we're going to take the U.N. at face value for what it's supposed to do, then the United Nations should be the governing body that makes the decision saying, OK, as a, as a nation or as a, as a globe, we've determined that in Niger there is a humanitarian issue that we can all agree that it should not be taking place. So as such, we will you know, work as a, a United Nations to go in and help alleviate whatever the issue may be now. I don't believe that that should be you know, one governing entity's job. But since it exists, and, and again, I'm a very pragmatic person, I look at the United Nations saying if it exists and we're funding it, then let's utilize the United Nations as it was originally intended to be utilized. Instead of saying the United Nations is our, our, you know, our, our feel-good representation of what the, the world governments should be look to to work towards in terms of you know working with one another and then behind the scenes the united states does what it wants let's use the un if it's going to be utilized as is supposed to be utilized going forward so so let me go back to my point and then we'll we'll circle back to the un saying in this particular situation the un should handle it are are we not saying well there is a problem that needs solved here and wouldn't you want america to be the the I mean, isn't America the best equipped to handle issues like this as opposed to the U.N., who is just another layer of bureaucracy on top of things, Brett? Well, so when it when it comes to how the, the U.N. Oh, yeah. operates, we're we're kind of going to with with what Brian uh, mentioned They're They're making a decision, but essentially it's the United States that's paying for it and and is sending both in dollars and in human lives. So. When we look at it that way, essentially, in my mind, we should at least be strong enough in our resolve to, quote, fix whatever is happening um, and do it as our own rather than hiding behind the shield of the U.N. Um, now, the, the point that you brought up with regard to is there something that needed to be solved or that isn't there a problem – well, the problem is exactly as we discussed earlier. It's that we have, through our earlier interventions, uh, continue to destabilize not only the Middle East but also now um, parts of Africa, further into Africa than than we were previously, and so we've essentially created the problem ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, the logic stands that we should be cleaning up our actual problem instead of continuing to chase the problem that we created and perpetuate. Right. Brian, what do you have to say to that? Brian. I mean, that, that, that's, that's spot on. Exactly right. I mean, like, like Brett just said, the, the entire premise of the United Nations is supposed to be this, this overarching, you know, uh, it, it's, it's supposed to be this, this uh, world government that prevents wars from happening i mean the entire premise of, of the united nations was formed after world war ii when we just watched you know the second world war happen millions of lives lost so with that being said the united nations is supposed to help prevent wars but with that with that also being said it's also the united nations job to look for opportunities where there could be trouble areas to help address it proactively but that's not an argument for the un that's saying since it, it exists and since we're funding it then let's stick to what the entire uh, intent of the United Nations was versus pretending the United States is supposed to be, you know, this, this pseudo, uh, you know, force behind the UN to make it work. Right. Well, part of the problem, <laughs> here's why I'm for ending the UN and ending American support for the UN, because it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. And its pre predecessor was the League of Nations in, in the shadow of World War One. 
Woodrow Wilson put together the League of Nations and spearheaded this under American authority because he was, you know, really the progressive forefather. And if you look at the League of Nations track record, you not only have, you know, things like the Spanish the Spanish uh, Civil War and then Hitler. <laughs> so you had a tremendous amount of breakdown of the international order after yep. the League of Nations was founded and uh, you can argue that the period after World War II has been a much more peaceful period than than those two world wars because the wars that men fought in the 20th century in the latter half were segmented to at least just one area at a time. But but it doesn't necessarily mean that it was more peaceful. I mean, the Americans just – George Bush didn't give a crap about the U.N. It was just basically a – minor roadblock on the war right. to destabilizing the country. The United Nations, if it's not going to stop the American government from going to war when it is the most when it is the most powerful uh, uh, the power most the biggest donor, the most powerful member and the moral center of the United Nations, then what good is the United Nations? I think 2003 broke the back of the moral authority and uh, just expose the myth that the United Nations is worth supporting in any way, shape, or form. And at this point, it's really just a bunch of bureaucrats talking to each other, not accomplishing anything. Russia isn't listening to the United Nations and the sanctions. North Korea isn't in terms of the Ukraine. North Korea is not listening to any of the sanctions in terms of uh, their nuclear program. Iran it never listened to the sanctions. Iraq, going back to Saddam, didn't even let the inspectors in with Mohammed al-Baradai Baradai, when they wanted to do inspections. So the U.N. is just really a toothless organization that does nothing but steal American dollars and create this uh, sense that something is being done in the world as opposed to anything actually being done. And it's just another level of government bureaucracy that just steals money from the world. And then you have things like the World Bank, where the World Bank, yes, it does help third world nations fund things. But I think if you read the work of John Perkins, what it actually does is the World Bank, it goes in and it it buys – it buys the resources of the natural resources of these poorer countries and essentially enslaves them to the World Bank. And so you, you have these international organizations that really don't do any good for the people that are living in these countries and don't really solve any problems. Uh, th that being said, I mean, uh, it has been a – the 21st century so far has been less catastrophic in terms of war – but I would argue that that is because of econo you know, the Internet, the freedom that the Internet has brought about, and the economic benefits of having the Internet. Right, Brett? Uh, well, yeah, for the 21st century for sure. Um, and I think that the U.N. actually gets a lot of credit that it doesn't deserve uh, with regard to the Cold War and that not escalating to be further uh, a, a hot war and, and essentially being World War III. Um, the United Nations is often given credit for that when in actuality it was just the fact that no one was really moving forward. Right. Um, the Soviet Union wasn't really actively acting. The United States wasn't actively acting against the, the Soviet Union. Um, and then we ended up that we were able to reach and out, moving out of the Cold War, we were actually able to destabilize the Soviet Union more through culture than mm. anything else. Right, And when people saw that – and so everything that has happened um, that the UN gets credit for is essentially just markets doing what they do and free markets showing the way in an, in an, in an issue where the Soviet Union was oppressive, their, their block was oppressive, and people didn't like that. They saw the freedom and the culture and all of the things that were happening in the rest of the world, and it wasn't the United Nations that prevented World War III – it was the fact that the U.S. and the Soviet Union couldn't quite ever have that fight. Mm -hmm. And then the United States wins the Cold War, and I use air quotes for people who are just listening. They win the Cold War simply by being a cultural influence uh, among the people that were prevented from seeing that. And the underground finally got to a point of critical mass, and they said, hey, look, these guys are wrong. We don't know about these guys, but at least we want to learn more about them. Right. And, and so 
but again, all of that comes back to, oh, well, it's that great organization we created in 1946 uh, after World War II that prevented the world from, you know, prevented the Cold War from escalating when that wasn't actually what happened. Right. So I want to go back to Brian, and I want to ask, I want to go back to these, uh, these is Islamic extremists. Because I think we have to ask ourselves as this debate starts to rage and the, the United States military is currently doing uh, military exercises around the concept of invading the con continent of Africa in 2023. Uh, so, And you can look that up. That's absolutely happening right now. Uh, it, it, obviously, terrorism is something that is uh, an important issue that we need to deal with. And we as Americans need to figure out what is the best way to fight terrorism. And I'd argue, question, do we need to fight terrorism and can we fight terrorism? Do we have the mm – -hmm. to, to me, the Brian, just because a warlord in Africa who has you know 50 Uzis and a few AK-47s and a group of 100 people – to me, that doesn't mean that we need to go over and send American military men to go and train the local police force and military to deal with these these band of rebels. Right. And just because you've got one warlord saying that he's now ISIS or Al Qaeda, <laughs> like what does that really does that really start to threaten us in any way, shape, or form? No, it doesn't. And 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 that's one thing I've actually I've gotten to. Uh, some, some fun debates with some of my neocon friends um, where they, they say that we need to, if, if we lit up right now on the war on terrorism, then, then they'll only gain, they'll, they'll, they'll come back stronger than ever before. And I, I look at them and I ask them, okay, so let's take that premise and assume that you're right. So when would you consider the United States to have won the war on terror? And I never have an answer because you can't have, a war on a word, which is terror. You can't, you can never not only not have the war, but with that being said, you can never accomplish the war. You can never complete the war saying we, we have defeated terrorism. It's like saying you know, we have defeated obesity in the United States. It's like, no, you, you, you won't defeat obesity. Maybe you can take strides into taking it down a little bit, but you'll never get rid of it. And, and if you stop looking at it, then all of a sudden it'll start coming back in a little bit, you know, throughout. being the, the neoconservatives is that the war on terrorism in their uh their short-term minds is defeating the likes of you know an osama bin laden or a, a saddam hussein or uh Muammar al Qaddafi, but they're not considering the long-term ramifications of saying okay if we go into let's say afghanistan and we spend 16 years conducting a quote-unquote war on terror to try to, to take out these bad guys, at the same point in time, we are, in our very presence being there, starting to radicalize and get uh, individuals who live in these areas incensed at the notion of the United States and what they're considering to be an imperialistic mindset. So it, it's almost like you're shooting yourself in the foot. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're conducting what you believe to be a means to end what is terrorism, but in reality, you're actually planting the seeds to build terrorism, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road that it just doesn't disappear. It will forever be there. I mean, I have family who and then, you know, they're the, the last end of their lives who they still look at Germany as a, a bad country because of World War II, strictly because of World War II. So to, to think that, you know, we have Americans who believe that. After 60 years of, of, you know, no war between us and Germany, just imagine if you are a child who watched your, your mom, your dad, sister, brother accidentally killed in an airstrike by the United States trying to defeat terrorists, air quotes. You don't think that that would harbor some resentment within that child's life going forward? And it, it, it's not a matter of saying, oh, they hate us for our freedoms. They hate us because we're over there doing to them what we would absolutely uh, – abhor having them do to us here in our land yeah as and brett as we talked about on tuesday 14 people were killed in syria when americans struck a town 
that has no military significance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We bombed the we bombed this town and killed 14 civilians. I mean, as Christopher Thomas pointed out in Dear Leader's Court, part of our our Patreon group, um, there, there are entire generations in the Middle East that just have never known a time when the Americans were not bombing their country. That's exactly right, and we are our enemy's greatest recruiter. Yeah. We we continue to be. Um, we see that Brian brought brought up exactly what we're you know that exact same thing. We are looking at a situation where. We continue to intervene. We continue to bomb. We continue to make these people's lives miserable. And it's getting to the point where we are living up to what ISIS, what Al Qaeda, what all of these groups have come together to portray us as. And that is the white devil who continues to come after them and oppress them. And all it does is recruit. It makes it makes their recruiting much easier. It gives them numbers. It gives them strength. We go, we try to, to squash whatever's happening, wherever we're seeing those numbers increase, and it's, it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. All right, well, we get these guys over here and then, until we're distracted by something yep. shiny over on the other side of, of a continent or a region, and then while we're taking, taking care, quotes, um, of what's happening on the other side of the continent or the region – they're building up saying, do you remember last month, last year, two years ago, five years ago when the United States was here and they were bombing weddings? Right. And when they were, you know, when people were being blown to smithereens, that was America that was doing that. And so it's really easy to say, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, of course, that makes perfect sense. So the thing that I was thinking when Brian was talking and, and you, this kind of works into that as well is – you take a look at how Hitler came to power in Germany, and a lot of it was an anger at the people that were oppressing them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that came in the sanctions and the, the things that happened uh, after World War I, um, the, the devaluation of their currency, um, and a lot of the things that allowed the rise of Nazis, specifically Hitler, to come into power, to do everything that they did to, to effectively change the entire culture – in a nation to set them up to be another power hungry group saying, Hey, we're just taking back what, what was taken from us. Right. And so we're, we're continuing and we're perpetuating that cycle. It's just a different part of the world. It's a different group of people. But at the end of the day, we're, we're feeding the negativity towards ourselves by being the best recruiter for our enemy. Yeah, I mean, and the, the perfect example of that is it, it, – hold on, Brian. The perfect example of that is Afghanistan. And yep. you, when you really go and you look at what's going on in Afghanistan, uh, Scott Horton is probably, in my mind, the preeminent non uh media person, thinker out there. Like, if you don't listen to Scott Horton, you should. And he did an interview uh, in the last week or two with somebody on Afghanistan, and they were talking about how – you have these areas of Afghanistan where the American populations or the American troops go in and they build these houses and schools and they put out a press release that they built these houses and schools, but they're like plywood and they collapse immediately and they're not even usable structures. They just are literally built for a photo op and that's what our American soldiers are doing. I mean it is – it, it, it's and it's not on them. I mean, if you watch the movie War Machine, which I thought was a great movie, it's with Brad Pitt. It's on Netflix. Um, I think yeah, it was called War Machine, and it just shows you the folly of Afghanistan and what's going on there. Actually, the interview that I heard was the Tom Wood show with uh, Scott Horton about you know a fool's errand, his new book about Af Afghanistan, and y you have these populations of the Taliban. Uh, the, the Taliban come in and they say to these local populations, choose between us and the Americans, and then they they choose the Taliban because they know the Americans aren't going to kill them, and they end up getting better services and better treatment in many cases because of the Taliban. And then in other areas you have the Peshmerga who have a very backwards culture 
compared to the Taliban, <laughs> and the and they're even worse off, especially women in some of those areas. So I can't recommend that interview with Scott Horton enough, and and the, those conversations with Scott Horton. But uh, Brian, I cut you off. You were going to say something about the effect of Americans in and the troops on local populations. Well, and, and that that really goes down to the entire premise: what is terrorism? Um, you know, and, and as Americans, we see terrorism as, based on our contemporary view of it, Islamic terrorism, and, and then the. Uh, 16 years of, of terroristic activities, but to those individuals living within the confines of the Middle East, they view us as terrorists. And it hurts to say that because, you know, I, I have always been a, a GOP, rah, rah, go America guy, but we have to imagine ourselves in the shoes of those that we are attacking. When you have a drone, if you're walking to school one day with your little sister and all of a sudden you see a drone fly over top of you, and, and a bomb land, you know, a block away, you don't you don't view that as anything normal. That that's that's you're being attacked, and, and the same thing would be true here in America. Um, and we would view that as a terroristic attack, just as we did nine eleven, and 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 rightfully so. But we were, and I say we, our, our neoconservative leaders who have promoted this this never ending sixteen year war that seems to to have no end in sight. They they have not only promoted a, a war that's going to cost us billions of dollars, but a war that's going to build resentment for America with America being the bad guy, not America being the good guy. Because despite our, our lens saying, yes, we are the good guys, we're fighting the good fight, for those kids that are watching what's happening, they're going to look at America as the bad guy. And then you know, 10, 5, 10, 15 years on the road, they will be the ones that we'll be facing on the battlefield because we have so incensed them through our our intervention in their home countries and have you know destroyed their communities we've destroyed you know their families and and we have nobody to blame but ourselves and our our you know our belief that we're out there doing the good the good thing to fight terrorism yeah so one of the things that I'm continuously reminded of as we continue to have this conversation was especially so when when Brian was bringing what was just saying uh making the points that he was is what's the difference between a terrorist and a freedom fighter it's your perspective and it's the lens through which you are seeing what's happening to them you're exactly right we are the terrorists because we are terrorizing them with the yep. bombs that happen we are terrorizing them with all of the things that that tear apart their families that destroy their lives that continue to recruit mm -hmm. more and more people to hate the united states to hate america and we are the bad guy and we continue to recruit those people to view us that way by our actions as we continue to terrorize the people. Again, we don't view ourselves as the bad guy because we're supposedly keeping the fight there, but the only fight that's happening there is us picking on the little guy. And if you look historically, and, and one of the things that I think really does help them recruit is you take a look at military history – and it's always it's the giant army that just becomes mm -hmm. so big. It's always defeated by a very uh, a very small um, ragtag group of people who are not necessarily operating by the principles, the common principles of war. Uh, you take a look at the American Revolution. The redcoats should have completely annihilated us, but they didn't because they didn't know what was happening. They we were the terrorists, right? And so. What we what we ended up the way we won was because we were able to be more uh, we were able to be more nimble we were able to be more intuitive we were able to be or more innovative we were able to we were able to do things that they weren't able to do because they couldn't operate in that way we find ourselves now to be in that same situation we cannot operate in the way that they do they we cannot you know we're spending our time running these military exercises and and bombing the heck out of people and sending troops like crazy to every far-flung corner of the globe but they're able to continue to win and their win is not the same as our win they can get a little win and they're happy right and it's it's a positive that they can use to recruit and then it's going to draw a reaction from us where they can use that negative reaction to recruit even more and so 
by not being able to fight as a nimble force, a very small and nimble force like they are, we find ourselves at a disadvantage when it comes to chasing down and winning a war on terror because it is so nebulous. They're able to permeate every crack that we have as a giant military force. Right. Final final comment on this before I bring up uh, mm-hmm. Trump being a degenerate. So go ahead, Brian. So my, my final thoughts on this would be um, one, one thing that I – hearing Brett talk about that that really made me just, just – really put things in perspective is that the the quote unquote terrorists, the bad guys in this perspective in, in the Middle East, they are utilizing a very similar uh, battle plan that we utilize against the, uh, the cold in the Cold War against the Soviets, where we went into this spending war where we were forcing the Soviet Union to spend you know millions and millions of dollars on keeping up with us. Um, in this case, though, the the the, the Islamic uh, extremists will say, they don't have to spend money. They can just do one or two random acts, you know, be it 9-11, be it the USS Cole, et cetera, et cetera, where in a reaction, we say, OK, we need to spend $800 billion in a, a federal budget for the Pentagon to defeat terrorism, whereas they're spending, you know, what, a drop in the, in the hat compared to what we're spending. So they're, they're literally able to do like a financial war against the United States. Um, but, but, you know, going forward, you know, I've said what I had to say about the, um, the war on terror and and us creating more issues than we were actually solving. But, uh, one thing I I know I saw in the comments, there was some confusion. I I'm not pro UN and I I don't believe the UN has the ability to solve the issues of the world. Um, but in in my, my perfect world, we are a part of the UN and in each nation, uh, relies within its own confines and its own ability. Uh, but in, in a pragmatic way, since 1945, the United States has been one of the number, or the top five nations within the United Nations that on the Security Council has uh, the ability to, to make and break a lot of uh, decisions that will impact the globe. Um, so as such, you know, let's if we're going to keep a United Nations, which I don't think we should, um, you know, at the very least, let's use the U.N., in a means that it was supposed to be utilized as being the uh, the peacekeeper, being the the nation of, or the not nation, but the uh, the entity that will go out and try to sniff out these uh, uprisings that could cause harm down the road, instead of just relying on the United States to be the policeman. Um, I don't believe the United Nations should be that role, but if it's going to be that role in our contemporary uh, society, then let's at the very least try to do it effectively. Yeah, and and I guess for for my part. Um, you know, so often libertarians and non-interventionists come across as anti-troop and uh, anti-military person, and we're certainly not anti-service uh, and anti-military men at all. In fact, we believe that it is important to have good policy because those are actual human lives, and there are human lives attached to those human right. lives. And when you start doing things that aren't effective and also cause more loss of life for our troops, local populations, for Americans down the road because of things like blowback, that, that we're, we're against those policies. It's not that we're against people who serve. It's that we're against those bad policies because we, we just – I think we love human beings more than somebody who just wants to send people across the sea – like pieces on a chessboard instead of actually thinking through the consequences and stepping back and examining the actual results of things and and I have to ask um just to touch briefly on what none of what you heard was covered in the news uh so we've just spent you know 50 55 minutes talking about Niger in a way that you didn't hear anywhere else in media what you heard was a discussion about Donald Trump and his mm-hmm. crassness, and and it distracts quite nicely <laughs> from the actual conversation, which is the one that we just had. And it all got tipped off when he made a phone call to uh, the fourth soldier who was missing in action uh, for f- 48 hours. Then they found his remains, and then he was he was brought back, and Donald Trump made a phone call to the widow and a congresswoman from Florida who looks like uh, John Benet Ramsey's corpse uh, was 
basically she's, on the David, she's a David Clark woman. Right. <laughs> she's something else. And she uh, <laughs> was on the line, and basically Donald Trump said, you know, uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. You know, he knew what he was getting into when he signed up, and he blah, 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 blah. Well, she took offense to that, and was angry and upset about that and then donald trump said that's not what he said and then the congresswoman and the woman said that is what he said and then and he got into another uh, uh, argument and then he dragged john kelly his chief of staff whose son died in 2011 in the wars uh and served also and put his credibility uh, up and basically put him in a position where he told two uh, untruths. <laughs> they, I don't think he was lying. I think he just was wrong in in his view. He seems like an honorable guy. Um, and Donald Trump's not wrong. You, when you sign up to go into the military, you know what you're getting into. You you have to accept the choice of losing your freedom to serve your country, and that you may end up in Niger in a firefight with Islamic extremists, and you may end up dying, and you may end up a political football. I mean, these are the consequences of your choices if you sign up. And I think what libertarians so often want to ask people who are civil servants, people who are soldiers, people who are police officers, firefighters, yes, we respect your service, but we also, and teachers, let's extend it to anybody that earns a government paycheck, anybody that earns a uh a welfare check or, or, or anything. If you're part uh, taking money from the taxpayers in some respect, um, and I think this is going to be an increasing topic of conversation that was set off by Jeff Flake, which we talked about in the last episode. What moral responsibility do you carry because of the choices that you are making? And can you or will you opt out of a system that you no longer feel is moral? So, for instance, if you are a school teacher who finds that pu the public education system is uh, corrupt and you're still continuing to accept that paycheck, are you willing to be a part of that or are you willing to stand up and say no? It's obviously more difficult for a soldier to do that because they sign contracts, they sign commitments, and you know you keep your word, but at the same time... Um, you know, that that's also part of the, the complexity of the libertarian argument that I think sometimes is not said with love. And we're trying to say that in a respectful way because we do honor the people who do serve and we want them to come home safe. We don't want another gold star mother or father or wife like we just don't. So I don't know that it that people necessarily know what they've signed up for. Right. Because they're not thinking about the fact that they could be sent to a far flung corner of the globe. They're thinking about. What they're going to be able to do for I their mean, family, they're going to be. Right. They're There's, thinking about the the honor that traditionally goes with military service. They're not necessarily thinking that they're going to end up in that firefight. Right. They aren't forward thinking enough. They, not a, not to, everyone. Not That's, everyone. There, there are some, I'm sure, that that do realize that. But there are there are simply more um, that just don't realize where where this ends. They don't realize where they're going to end up. They don't realize that these things aren't – that they're too focused on what's mm -hmm. immediately in front of them and potentially the short term, but they're not looking at the long term. They're not looking at the end game. They're certainly not looking at the fact that uh, throughout history we've, we've not honored those contracts that right. you just talked about where we've stop-lost individuals. Yeah. Um, where we've made it a situation where, yeah, it's fine that your tour is over, but we've decided that you're going back to the desert, right. and you have no say in this. Yeah, People aren't thinking about that. And I have a personal connection with something like that where I, I can see why people didn't get that far in their thinking, and they aren't necessarily seeing the end game, the end consequence. They're seeing the short-term benefit to them and they're willing to give up that freedom briefly for it are we talking about your girlfriend morgan no we're not <laughs> uh all right <laughs> we have a hard out with bittner uh because he's he's under the thumb of a 22 year old blonde and uh she's uh he, she he <laughs>
He's, yes, she's, he's been given the command to leave here at 9 p.m. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bittner's uh, Diabetes Day is tomorrow, essentially. Yes. And <laughs> within one year, you lost how much? 75 pounds. 75 pounds. And you cur- Bittner's cur- D-Day. Yeah. You c- it's actually T2D Day is what we call it. Why? Uh, type 2 Diabetes okay. Day. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so I, I do – I. It's not something that we've really delved into because we've been um, stuck on policy, but I am keto curious. All right. And I've never been keto curious, and (laughs) and I know that this is not politics, but I do think that we probably have a large amount of fat asses in our audience that are curious, too, about how you did it because you went from a fat ass (laughs) to a shell of yourself. Uh, Frankly, like, all right, if you want to know what Bittner looks like, let me paint a picture for you. If he had a baseball hat on, he looks like Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. Uh, so he's Oh, now. <laughs> yeah, now. Got it. Okay, right. yeah. I was like, wait a second. He was really skinny in Philadelphia. Right, exactly. And before that, he looked like a fat chipmunk. And so, right, storing up with nuts in his mouth before the winter comes. And uh, so I do, I do think it is uh, – so I've got two people here who have lost a tremendous amount of weight. I have – I've hit a wall, to be quite honest, over the last couple months, and it's and it's tough to get back into that cycle. Um, and so I want to ask you about keto. Sure. Uh, because it, I wouldn't be curious if I hadn't seen how well you've done on it. Yes. And, it, it, and how quickly you lost weight. Yeah. And I, I am anti-carb for the most part. Uh, and I always feel better when I eat more fats than when I eat more carbs. Right. And uh, so last December, You're I halfway there. Yeah, exactly. Well, last December I was lying on what I call mega couch, which is the cushions of one couch and then the, the two from a former couch, all over the floor here in the apartment, lying by a fire with fire with my two cats. I ordered pizza every single night so I did not have to cook because I was too lazy to move, and I felt so miserable because I hadn't moved. I had gone to the doctor in that, that last November and said, what's wrong with my leg, my sciatica? I've got sciatica, my nerves acting. He's like, you're just not moving your legs, and so that's why they hurt. Uh, you're, you're an animal, and you need to move your body. And uh, during that Christmas break, I watched a Joe Rogan pod- podcast with Mark Sisson, and he talked about um, – why it's important to lift weights and why it's important to be active mm-hmm. because when you get older you you know you don't exercise your heart you don't exercise your lungs you don't exercise your organs you get into a situation where you fall and break a hip and then you develop pneumonia and your your lungs are too weak to cough up everything in your lungs and so you die of pneumonia at 75 because you didn't spend a life of being active and so so that really motivated me because I was like, oh, wow, okay. And so about August, I stopped working out. I got way too busy. I've had a ton of stress, uh, and now I'm kind of getting back on it. I'm on Blue Apron. Uh, if you, uh, I cannot recommend Blue Apron enough. It, it has been awesome. I love it. It's All the meals have been great except for one. Uh, if you want $30 off, use the code Bob and Tom uh, <laughs> at uh, blueapron.com slash Bob and Tom. Uh, it it's been great, and I'm eating healthy, but I also still feel like a fat ass. Uh, I'm not exercising as much as I should, but I'm still exercising and lifting a lot, and I still have a lot of that mass I built. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few minutes, Brett Bittner, and mm-hmm. and Brian, what what's uh, are you a keto are you a, a keto head too? I I wouldn't say I'm a keto head. Um, but I definitely, I've utilized keto. So once you get beyond just, just weight loss, um, you, you go into a lot of, of what's called building and bulking. Um, and during my bulk or my, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bulk and lean, my, my apologies. Um, so when I'm leaning out, what I try to do is really focus on a keto diet, uh, because I mean, keto is the epitome of, uh, leaning out because you're, you're forcing your body to utilize your existing fat as energy. Um, So if you can imagine, for instance, right now your current, the current way your body works, you're, you're using carbs for energy. So if you eat a piece of bread, your body breaks down the carbs to be sugar, which Mm -hmm. then is the sugar is then utilized as um, your energy for the day. 
whatever is not utilized is then stored as fat. Mm-hmm. Now, where keto uh, comes into play is that your body goes into a state of ketosis, which means your body has gotten to the point where it's no longer utilizing the the carbs that you eat every day mm-hmm. for energy. And that means it has to find a new means to find energy. So what it does is it first will go to the fat. Um, so if you have excess fat, your body will start to use your reserve fat to help, uh, you know, give you energy throughout the day. And and the, the best way I explained it to my girlfriend, because she she was a little skeptical on keto. Um, I said, imagine you're driving a car and your car, you're, you're at 50 percent gas in your car and you're getting down to like 25 percent. When you're on keto, it just feels like all of a sudden the, the gas tank goes back up to to 50% after you, you've dropped some gas because your body just starts to find more means of energy. Mm-hmm. So when I, when I'm doing a lean, I mean, I, I feel absolutely phenomenal. I, I have so much energy. I feel like I can run marathons. Uh, and when I bulk, <laughs> I, I eat carbs. I feel like death because right. my body's just not used to utilizing only one form of energy. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Brett can go into much greater detail what he's experienced for just just the weight loss aspect, but um, in terms of, of, of bulking and cutting, um, you know it, it it's a great tool to utilize to not only give your give your body the chance to to burn off excess fat, but also just to experience a really it's a different way of living because you're no longer thinking about like oh I'm hungry I need to get food so I can I can carry on throughout the day. You just feel like you have this never-ending supply of energy, yep. and it's just—it's intoxicating. Yeah. So, all right, and that's the voice of Brian Nichols, and he's the host of the Around the Republic podcast. But uh, Brett Bittner has a podcast called "You Can't Outrun the Fork," <clears throat> and I'm remiss in promoting your podcast at the start of the show. No, that's I'll, okay. I'll make sure to put those in the podcast. But you know, Bittner has a We Are Libertarians podcast called uh, "You Can't Outrun the Fork," and you can get that how you can go to you can find it on iTunes. You can go to uh, you can't outrun the fork dot com. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, just like everything cool. else. Um, and I want to thank Brian. I mean, he really did a great job of explaining kind of what keto does from a more uh, scientific perspective um, than I even go into on the podcast. Right. Um, I'm talking about my journey, what happened for me, and why 37 feels better than 27 and mm-hmm. even better than 22 did. Right. Um, and so Brian's exactly right. You do feel terrific. Um, I did not realize how terrible it felt eating carbs all the time because that was just what I was used to. Right. I had a terrible diet. I was drinking sweet tea. Everybody in the in the live stream tonight was joking, oh, is that sweet tea that you have in your – no, it's not. I might have some tomorrow. It's on my list of things <laughs> that are for all the terrible things that I shouldn't eat and drink. Um, but you know, I drank sweet tea. I would – I had no problem – uh, driving by the Krispy Kreme, seeing the hot donut sign on and stopping in for a dozen, eating six while they were still hot and saving six to microwave to be hot the next day. Your your Chick-fil-A diet was out of this world. Oh, I went to Chick-fil-A every single day. Yeah. What, yeah. Did, what, what, what were you eating? Uh, well, I, it wasn't it, – actually, when it, when you look at it compared to the rest of what I was eating, it wasn't that bad. Um, generally speaking, it was a Chick-fil-A sandwich mm-hmm. uh, with a lot of bread, a lot of breading on the on the chicken. Um, and it was nuggets and bread, it was sweet yep. tea, but it was two sweet teas that were this big, right? That's so 500 30... calories of pure sugar, right? So I was saying like what, at least like what, 80 grams of sugar at, at least. Oh, at least easily. Yeah. And I, when I was three thirty, and I, I used my at fitness, least, yeah. I I'm, I'm down to two seventy five, and I was, my highest was three thirty. And I started using my fitness pal to to get down, and I was eating five thousand calories a day because it's so easy to do. You yeah. you go to McDonald's for breakfast, you get a hash brown mm-hmm. and an egg McMuffin. You go to a, a rich lunch, you know yep. where we used to work. Oh it was, yeah, walk acre- across the street, you waddle yourself over to the uh, to the Brew Burger. You mm-hmm. have a twelve hundred calorie lunch with a Coke easily. You're sitting there, you get a candy bar that you eat. That's another five hundred yeah. calories uh, in Reese's cups. And then 
you know, you go to BW threes or for, dinner, yeah. for Wendy's for, and then you have another fifteen hundred calories, and then you have maybe a piece of candy before bed, and you've had three cokes that don't day. Don't forget about ice cream, and, and don't right. forget about this and that and the other. Yeah, yeah, and it's so easy to eat five thousand calories, and you just don't realize it. And my fitness pal really helped me, and I probably should get back to that. But I want you, Brett Bittner, to give me your elevator pitch on keto diet. Okay, so here's what it is. I feel better. Um, it wasn't about losing weight for me. That was an side effect. And I fall asleep when my head hits the pillow. Right. I have enough energy to run throughout the entire day. Right. Way more than I had when I was drinking caffeine through the sweet tea and the soda. And we're talking probably um, two liters of sweet tea and a liter of soda every day. Jeez. And that's a lot of caffeine, too. So, I mean, yeah. that's really – pump. okay. So, since I started almost a year ago, uh, mm-hmm. blood sugar is back to normal. Cholesterol is no longer a concern for my doctor. In fact, it's rather low. It's in the ideal range uh, for somebody my age. Um, my blood pressure, which was hypertensive, is now normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so – and my resting heart rate, which was almost 100 – is now in the 60s and 70s. Wow. No shit, really? Yes. And that's eating, well, you remember the bacon Holy challenge of shit, March, man. where it was bacon every single meal. Right. I had to have bacon in every single meal, right. and I only missed two um, in March of 2017. So it's not that I'm eating, you know, I am i didn't all of a sudden become a vegan. Right. Uh, I, I am eating bacon. I am eating Beef. I'm. I mean, I'm eating a ton of meat, a ton of cheese, a ton of eggs. Things that are awesome. Right. Things that are easy for me to prepare. I do what's called lazy keto. I'm not sitting down and and you know do, me, doing meal prep for a whole week. Um. You know, I did that for the first couple of weeks to figure out what I could and couldn't eat. Yeah. Once I figured out what I could and couldn't eat, the meals that I could prepare that I could have, um, it actually got to the point where after about around the beginning of 2017. I had to force myself to eat to take my meds. Mm. I had to remember, hey, you have to eat because you have to take these meds in order to get your blood sugar back under control like the doctor told you or else you're going to die. Because you just didn't have hunger. Right. I I was not hungry. I'm still not hungry. Right. The first time, the first thing I ate today was when I came up, right before I came over here. Right. So when you went to Chick-fil-A tonight, what did you have instead? Okay. So I didn't have my normal Chick-fil-A. I just had nuggets. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't have the grilled nuggets because I was lazy. Bittner. Yeah. Are, but but are, you, are you doing intermittent fasting as well? Uh, that came naturally around the first of the year um, when it was tough for me to really remember wow. to eat. Because I wasn't hungry, I had basically fallen into a 16-8 intermittent fasting. Explain that. Uh, so 16-8 is where you eat in an eight-hour period of the day, but you do not eat in 16 hours of the right. day. And generally, all that is is skipping breakfast. Right. You yep. have lunch by you know have lunch around noon, and you have dinner before eight, mm-hmm. and then you eat nothing else the rest of the day, which is not that hard because think about it: about eight of those hours, you're probably asleep. Sure. So it's just the end of the night after your dinner Mm -hmm. and the beginning of your day before you go to lunch. Right. And I fell into that naturally. I had to force myself to eat lunch every day so that I could take the meds because they were spread out where I had to take meds twice a day. Mm-hmm. So so I think people think about it. And, and in the summertime, I mean, I really only grill out. I mean, yeah. I literally – because I'm, I'm kind of a lazy cook. And that's Perfect. where, like, the Blue Apron stuff is hard for me to do. And I'm stacked up with, like, nine meals in there just because <laughs> I, I haven't got I, – I just haven't cooked, so I get lazy. And so the summertime is great because I go out, I fire up the old electric grill. It oh, warms, yeah. It warms up in 10 minutes. You throw the meat on there. You throw the asparagus on there. Perfect. The, or I like sweet potatoes as okay. well. And then and then you eat your dinner, and it's done within 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, rest in peace after literally – I used my electric grill, the, uh, the Charbroil pat- Patio Bistro or whatever it is. It's great. I love it. But after two years of daily use between April and October, it died this, oh, this year. Oh, sorry to hear that. But it's okay. Maybe I, you can get a real grill. I, well, the element broke sorry, because I cleaned, it, I cleaned it too hard. I dropped the grate on it, and <laughs> okay. I broke the element. So, But 
Uh, love the electric grill, uh, and I don't care. You none of you have tasted my meat when I prepared on the grill, except for uh, I have. Uh, you have, yeah, yeah. That's right. I came over. Yeah, it's very that's good, isn't it? Said. It's very good. My meat's uh, well marinated, and so I love to to grill meat. Yeah. But like, am oh, am I just? Uh, and don't worry, chat room, because in the leaders' court, they're mocking my electric grill. As well, they should. Version 3.0 is coming next April. All right. Uh, I'm going to get another one. I, I, but I may get, I may get, uh, I, it, it, listen, I saved, I spent $120 on a grill that I use literally every day yeah. for most of the months of the year, and that's all the fuel I had to buy. Like, sure. it saves you so much money, and it tastes just the same. It's easy. It heats up. It's, yeah. it's yeah. great. It's, so it's good. Anyways, am I just going to eat meat the whole time? No, not necessarily. That's just what's easy for me. There are even vegan ketoers. Okay. I can't do that because so much of the fat comes from the nuts, yep. and <laughs> I I'm allergic to something. It, let me tell you in in l- that in that realm. If you're a vegan gluten free ketoer, man, kill yourself. Honestly, right? Well, no. I, I mean, there's actually an no, admin. No, 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 no. I mean, that was a declar- That was not a question. That was a de- declarative statement. Kill yourself. Do us all a favor and die. I'm just kidding. Just but anyways. So, but like. Go. There are so many tricks yeah. that you can do. Yeah. Like, for instance, uh, one thing I will do is every morning when I have my coffee in the mm-hmm. morning, I will take two tablespoons of coconut oil. Yep. And I'll plop that in my coffee. Yep. And the coffee, you know, it'll melt it down. And you'll have um, – it, it's bulletproof coffee. And yeah. It is phenomenal. I mean, I – I'm. It's weird. I'm allergic to coconut, the like actual nut. Yeah. But I'm. I'm okay with coconut butter and oil, which is right. weird. But, um, you put the the coconut oil into the the, the coffee because it's probably it, the, it gives you a little sweetener. Yeah, it's probably the proteins that you're your, your allergic caffeine to. fix. Yeah. But. I, I don't drink coffee. Yeah, and, and you get like, that's okay. Like, you don't need to. I, I forget how many grams it is. Like twenty grams of fat or something like that. Yeah. It's phenomenal. So yeah, you're you're basically what you're doing is you're taking a look at the the food that you're eating. And your goal is to have around 70% of your calories come from fat. Okay. About 25% of your calories yep. come from protein and about 5% to come from carbs. And the carbs that you're getting, I'm not saying that you should eat like half of a Snickers to get your carbs. It should be the asparagus. It should be the broccoli. It should, <laughs> yeah. be, the, it should be the green vegetables that aren't yes. root vegetables, not potatoes, not onions, not carrots. But your, you know, your broccolis, your cauliflowers, good carbs. not bad, but they're, they're good carbs. They're vegetable carbs. That's what you're getting outside of the meat that you're going to be eating. The, well, it, it's, to me, like the macros of 70, 25, and 5, like th- that's crazy to me. But, I, I mean. It feels that way at first. Yeah. But once you see the difference and how easy yes. it is to maintain that and how good you feel. Right. You don't want to go back, and and so, you know, yes, I and will like, have a day like tomorrow. Me, like it, that's one thing I noticed with my life; it made my life so much easier. Because yeah. if you can plan throughout the day, like you know what, I'm gonna have you know a, a chicken breast for lunch with some blue tree blue cheese dressing and a very small side of of some spinach greens. Yep. Like if you can plan that ahead of time. And make it taste good. I mean, yep. that's one thing that if, if you're not a good cook, I, I strongly recommend going and looking at, at Food Network or going to uh, allcooks.com. Just like going through, yep. finding the, these uh, abilities to cook better and make your food taste good. And you're not looking at like, oh, I'm eating chicken every single day. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm the- eating chicken that I've seasoned. It tastes amazing. Right. right. And then I know that it's good for me. Instead of just like depending on Burger King to give you a, a, a grilled chicken, air quotes, that has so many preservatives, so many extra things you don't know about, that's so bad for you. Like you can make your own stuff, make sure it tastes good, and then find out it's good for you because you're you're confident it's good for you. Yeah, I will say the best cookbooks that I've ever read, and I've read a lot of cookbooks because I'm a nerd like that. Um with the well fed series are really good and that's all primal that's all keto or or paleo and then the America's Test Kitchen everything they do is great their oh, yeah. their paleo cookbook was amazing i mean is is keto the same thing as paleo no it's a little there's okay so you're no, going to be no. there are a lot of similarities and it's not as much of a focus on like for paleo it's more about okay well these are the things that our ancestors kind of Right. 
for keto, it's more about focusing on the high fat and the low carb. It's about the macros. It's about the macros, and you can figure out your macros at the beginning. You know what you're gonna you know what you're gonna eat, and again, you're gonna fall into IF. Almost every keto or I know has fallen into IF very quickly. What does that mean? Intermittent fasting. It was it was the thing that we talked about, the sixteen okay. eight or twenty four where it's twenty hours a day where you don't eat, four hours where you do. And there are actually people who go days without eating. Hmm. And I totally could. But the things that I take, you know, the medicine that I take, I, I try to make sure I eat at least once a day. Right. Um but again, that's pretty tough. Hey, Bittner, yeah. Have have you seen that guy that have you seen that guy who um he, he's on YouTube and he only eats at like it, it's it's a 24 20 dash four eating cycle for intermittent fasting. Yeah, where you only eat between the hours of 12 a.m. and 4 4 a.m. It's nuts. Oh, that's yeah. See, I, I'm not as again, I'm doing it lazy because I'm kind of lazy when it comes to this. Right. Because I'm trying to break out of <laughs> what was a terrible diet. Right. Lots of sugar, lots of carbs, just lots of food, lots of terrible things. To have my body burn cleaner, burn the ketones, burn the fat, um, and run on that rather than running on the sugar that made me feel I like mean, crap. I and would so, never recommend anybody to. I would never recommend anybody to eat only four hours a day between the hours of twelve a.m. and four a.m. Uh, yeah, I, like, I heard this guy on YouTube anybody. be like, "That's that's all he would eat." Yeah, the, and it's, it's insane. And like, but fact, you can really train your yeah. body to do anything. Let me stop you right there, Brian. That's. Stupid. Uh, I, I, I have found that yes, when, I, when I lose weight, I lose weight when it's effortless. Yeah. And I lose weight when it's easy. When I'm thinking about stuff, then it's hard. See, this was and easy and effortless it, it, for me. Exactly right. So if you're doing a diet that feels like work, then you're not yeah. going to last. You're not going to stick on it. Yeah. And kind of what, I, what I've always maintained, in, and I've fallen off the wagon lately, and I've been eating out too much, and I've been you know just – you know, I had a can of SpaghettiOs for dinner yesterday because I had it and it was soft and I had dental surgery yesterday. But and I felt terrible after it. All that sodium and processed nonsense. It just it's gross. But so but what I try to stick to is that if it's been alive in the last 30 days, I'll eat it. I mean, that's that goes for dating, too, Brian. Uh, like you want to stick to just kind of living food, the food that is. And I stick to organic. I'm generally an organic person because I, I want it. Some of it, I'm sure, is BS, but I'd rather just pay the extra 30 cents and not take the risk. Sure. Um, and so, and that's where Blue Apron's been great for me in that I, it just, it's been, it's all fresh, good food and s- recipes that I've never Hashtag tried before. Plug. Yeah, exactly right. Well, uh, but, while, we're, while we're on that, Talking about the Blue Raprons and the HelloFresh and all that, there's actually a keto-friendly one called Keto Fridge. Interesting. Okay. And now, I haven't tried it okay. because I don't cook a lot at home other than – well, I mean, I basically I cook every night now, but it used to be that I didn't cook at home at all. Right. And it was just about eating out and just figuring out what I could and couldn't have. Yeah, I, I just – I feel terrible right now, and I can tell you it's because I'm eating terrible and I'm not exercising. And for me, it's the sa- it's the same exactly what you said. I I always had trouble sleeping. I never I would stay up. I would lay there for 3 hours before my brain would finally shut off. Yeah. And when I'm in a period where I'm going to the gym and lifting weights and exercising and pushing myself in the gym 3 times a week at least, I f- every single night I just lay my head and and I just fall right asleep. Yep. And uh same with diet. And diet and exercise are just so important to your mental acuity, your health, your overall emotional well-being, your relationships like I'm just – I'm tired and sluggish and, like, this suffers because I'm just too lazy to eat well and prep and just because I, I had to take a nap before we do the show. So I'm going to get through it. I mean, so so it, – but it, I will say – like, yeah, go ahead, Brian. And Brett, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, it, it, yeah, when, when you start this, this lifestyle of, like, just trying to not only better your health but better yourself, you, you just – your your body naturally it, it thanks you because you've been I'm not saying you personally Chris but like just in general if you are not taking care of yourself your body knows it and it can feel it so yeah. if you're able to start going ahead and like you know going to the gym you're burning off fat so your body's lighter all of a sudden your joints are like hey I I can walk without having some pain yeah. or you're burning calories and you go to bed and then you're like wow 
you know what? I burned some energy today. And I'm actually, I'm physically tired because I haven't eaten an excess amount of calories, my body's still trying to burn it off. I mean, your body, and, and this is what, the, and Brett, you can testify this as well. Like your body goes on the line and it will thank you every step of the way saying, you know what? This is a healthier way for not only myself, but for my 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 personal uh, relationships with with those in my life, mm-hmm. but also your physical relationships because you're you're able to do so much more in terms of going out, running a five k, or or you right. know having having those those uh, fun times with your friends doing whatever it may be. But you have the ability to do that now, so it's it's a mental and physical benefit. And I I can't recommend getting healthy uh, more than enough. And, and Brett, I'm sure you can testify to that as well. And Chris, I mean, you've made a heck of a change too. I mean, I look at your pictures from not only what, what, like six months ago, and like you've lost a, a shit ton of weight too. Oh yeah, no, um, I've, so I've don't definitely discount that. no. You, I mean, you've come if a long I, way and yeah, if I don't go, if I don't go to the gym every three days, I'm miserable. Like I've got to go. And I went in uh, to my personal training session. I go to a personal trainer once a week. That's helped keep me accountable. And and you look at it and you go, okay, well that's two hundred dollars a month, and that's a lot of money. And that's a stretch, but at the same time, it really has been worth it to have someone teach me how to do this stuff. You know, I was I was squatting wrong, and I was going to blow my knees out within a year and a half if I had gotten heavier and heavier, like in terms of lifting weights. I didn't realize I had a torn supraspinatus, and so he's been able to help me work through that that I tore 15 years ago. Uh, and so that's been great to have that program. I'd recommend Bigger, Leaner, Stronger by Mike Matthews, which is really good. I, uh, I love Legion Athletics. That's what I use, and sometimes Muscle Feast as well. Both highly rated, tasty stuff, good stuff. And then Mark Ripito is actually a libertarian. He has a program called Starting Strength. But I cannot recommend lifting weights enough. I hate cardio. I get bored with it. Lifting weights really trains your mind in a way and pushes you in ways that uh, y- you know I hadn't done since I was in high school and it, and it was great and, and Brett you could probably attest to this the the discipline that you have to use to to do this and, and the discipline that I have had to use in the gym in lifting excuse me that discipline translates to many other areas of your life. It does. So I, I wanted to hit on a couple of things. The mental and emotional clarity that I have seen in the change in the way that I eat has been phenomenal. It's been absolutely amazing to see how much better I feel, how much more clearly I think, and how much more in touch with um, how I'm feeling, like right. my actual emotional well-being. That has improved vastly. It, it actually kind of does. Um, so the other thing is, you talk, you've talk you talked about how exercise makes you feel good. The beauty of what keto has done for me is I hate working out. Right. Um, I hate doing active stuff. I, mm-hmm. I am not, in, I was not interested in hiking or rock climbing or walking or any of that. Right. Not interested, but I feel so much better. My body is ready to take that on. Right. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, you know what? Now, not only because I feel better, but also because I don't have that block of, you know, this really big dude probably should not be going to whitewater rafting. Yeah. You know, he might sink the boat. Well, right. I can tell you that when I went whitewater rafting as a 200 50 plus pound guy versus going whitewater rafting at 175. I had so much more fun at 175 and I was able to enjoy it so much more than I did when I was a 250 plus guy. Um, I've actually wanted to, you know, walk instead of, you know, take an Uber. Right. When I'm downtown yeah. and I'm looking for something, you know, if I'm looking for someplace to eat or something to go do or, or whatever. So, I want, I'm actually seeking out the physical activity rather than, um, rather than it being what pushes me or me having to commit to that. I'm seeking it out because uh-huh. it's something that I want to do and I have the energy to do that. Right. No, no, no. There's nothing holding me back. I'm doing it. I, 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 I choose not to lift weights. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah.
That's exactly right. And and so the other thing you talked about your joints, and and I know Brian talked about his as well. Um, when you reduce the carbs, you're reducing the inflammation mm-hmm. in your joints. Huge. And so I can't tell. Like my knees felt terrible. My ankles, my back, basically everything that is involved in standing, all of the joints that are involved in standing and walking felt terrible. Yeah. Now I feel, I, I continue to say it and it's totally true. 37 feels better than 22 did. Yeah. Uh, Brian, when you're, when you're lifting, I mean, carbs are an essential part of any kind of healthy lifting regimen and diet i mean so are you full are you like hardcore keto when it are you like a five percent carbs when you're lifting carbs the rest being the combination of fats and proteins um that's that's going to be my <laughs> my, my uh, intake of the day and you okay. know there, it, are li- uh, there are actually people who lift there are actually people who lift brian there are actually people who lift that uh they are keto in fact you're starting to see it with some of the iron men and the ultra marathoners uh, you're starting to see it a bit in the seals and yeah i've noticed the, that yeah some of the you know more elite uh, and special forces where they're doing it because what they're able to do is because of the ease with which you can fast, they can go for days without eating but not feel yep. an energy depletion. Uh, lifter uh, Mark Bell has the and, power and cast. Goes- Mark Bell has the power cast. Triple H, the wrestler, is keto. Joe DeFranco has a podcast. He's keto. Yeah. Uh, these so these guys are keto too, and they and they lift, and so it doesn't seem to be a problem for them. In fact, Mark Bell, which is one of the subjects of a great documentary called Bigger, Faster, Stronger about steroids and then prescription thugs, uh, he looks great better. Yeah, yes. better looks better than he ever has before. So, I want to I want to ask, uh, what does your typical meal look like, Brett? So for dinner last night, um, I cooked five eggs, scrambled them. Mm-hmm. Uh, had mild cheddar cheese, and I had seven strips of bacon. That was my dinner yesterday. Okay. Um, I will free. Uh, let's see. Two weeks ago, I cooked uh, pizza uh, for Morgan and her family. Uh, well, she and I cooked pizza together for her family. Right. Um, we had a keto crust. We had keto pizza, um, and it was delicious. What and the hell's a keto crust? Best. So the keto crust is eggs, Parmesan cheese, and Italian seasoning. You mix it all together. Make it just like you would a regular pizza crust, um, and then you put it in the oven, and then you put your toppings on later. Mm. So you, you get a really low-carb uh, uh, tomato sauce, marinara sauce, or tomato paste, and then put cheese on top, the, the toppings the you want. The key is the crust first. The key is the crust first, yes. Um, and it's about a it's a 15-minute deal yeah. to get the, the crust. Can, um, can you- actually, that's been about a month. Two weeks ago, we did keto fried chicken. So can you like cheat like if you do keto every day, but then like you go like tomorrow I'm going out. Let's say we're going out to my favorite family pizza place. Can I cheat and have the pizza? Okay, so yes and no. Uh, the no part is it's going to knock you out of ketosis. You're going to have to get back into it. You're going to have to go through some of those some of the pains that getting in. And we talked about this in episode one. Um, where you're going to have what's called the keto flu. You're going to have the cramping in your legs. You're going to have you know some of the terrible feeling that you do after you eat carbs. Okay, right. So you're going to have, one, you're going to feel terrible for having eaten the carbs um, in the same way that you're doing now. Two, you're, you're going to have the, the path back into ketosis. Um, now, I'm a lazy ketoer. I don't always stick strictly to macros. 
Um, and so as I've gone and I've had, you know, a cheat here or cheat there, it isn't really a cheat for me. It's about, I try to make it celebratory. Right. And I try to make it rare. And this is something I learned from Penn Jillette mm -hmm. uh, in his book, Presto, where he talked about his weight loss journey when he lost over a hundred pounds by becoming vegan and, and really drastically changing the way that he eats. You celebrate things in a rare and appropriate way. Right. Now, as I have gotten closer and closer to having uh, my blood sugar under control and normal for a non-diabetic, I have been able to cheat or celebrate it more, or it's less rare mm -hmm. and less appropriate because it's, it's not affecting the blood sugar. Right. Because I'm not doing it all the time. It's, you know, oh, well, I mean, we're having, you know, we're, we're having La Rosa's pizza for the first time. Right. Um, during the Georgia game. You know, that was, that was something that happened a couple weeks ago. And, okay, yeah, sure. I, I didn't feel terrible after. Um, but, you know, I could tell that I'd been knocked out of ketosis, you know, and it took a couple of days to get back in, and then I felt back to normal. And now, I felt the, the fantastic feelings that I do when my body is burning fat and running on ketones. Now, you lost me when you said key, ketone flu. What? what, what? It's keto flu. So it's something that happens in the first few days of, yeah, so it's, it's essentially your body's dehydrated because you are probably don't have enough salt. Right. Um, you are, you're essentially chain, your body is fighting back against you getting rid of the sugar that it runs on. Right. And so it's in panic mode and it's saying, hey, this sucks. I'm going to make you feel terrible. Right. Because I don't like this because I was doing this just fine burning sugar. Right. Prehistorically, we love carbs. We love sugar. We love fruits. We love that stuff because it's easy, storable calories. Right. And so it's easier for us to survive, whereas protein is much harder to break down. And so that's why your body... It loves that. It loves the uh, the the cheap it was, it the was cheap energy. Easy, it was easy energy. Cheap energy. It was cheap and easy. It was right there. And when you're telling your body, "Hey, you're not going to have that anymore. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to figure out another way to power us." Right. It's your body's rejection of that idea. Yeah. And it wasn't as bad for me, I think, because I was also onboarding my meds, which made me feel absolutely terrible, which I think we've talked about on, yeah. a, on an episode of We Are Libertarians. Uh, I was breaking my addiction to caffeine at the same time. So I had a pretty terrible November when it came to how that... And so I couldn't isolate things to keto flu at, because I had all of those things happening at once. Right. Um, so my keto flu experience is different from others. Mm -hmm. um, but for but I can tell when I've gone off the reservation. When I was uh, on the cruise at the beginning of October, I didn't stick strictly keto. Right. I had key lime pie in, in Key West. I'm not going to give that. You know, I had dessert. Um, mo uh, I think most nights on the cruise, um, I made sure that I you know I had a fruity drink in my hand when I was sitting out by the pool and I was getting my tan on and things like that I wasn't going to deprive myself but I wasn't necessarily going absolutely crazy like tomorrow is going to be where I have a list of things that I absolutely have to have right I have to have pizza I have to have beer I have to have pineapple are you I, are I you afraid so like I, I did the Atkins diet in college and yeah. I did really well for a month I dropped like 30 pounds in a month I yeah and and, and because like, the the first month of yeah. The induction phase of Atkins is essentially what keto is the whole time. Right. And so you lose just all that water, all that inflammation. Your yeah. cells let go of all that water that it was holding on to. Your body's not in panic mode because it feels like it's under attack because of the carbs and the wheat and the yep. processed food and all that. And so it was, but then it was my birthday. So I went and celebrated on my birthday at Penn Station and had a delicious sub and fell right off the wagon. Okay. I gained all that weight back. Like, are you worried about tomorrow? Like, uh, that. You go and you have all these things, and then all of a sudden, just something clicks in your brain. And you're just like, sugar. Well, okay. So the reason that I'm not worried about that is because I'm going to remember what happened on my birthday in 2016. Mm -hmm. I had a third of a slice of cheesecake in celebration of it being my birthday. When right. I was out doing the uh, when I was judging the pageant out in Terre Haute, mm -hmm. um, and I was on my way back, and I was about an hour and a half removed from having eaten, and I just felt like absolute crap right and i just felt so terrible and that happens pretty much every time i go way off mm -hmm. i will feel absolutely awful 
the thing for me is if I were to moderate myself back to the way I used to eat, I could see me falling off there. But because I know that for something like tomorrow, um, I'm going to enjoy in the moment. Right. But I know that I'm going to pay for it after. Right. I know that I'm going to feel terrible. And I know that I'm basically going to have a sugar hangover on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I know that. But I'm preparing for it. And I know that come Saturday, it's going to be back to normal. It's going to be back to my new normal. And because of the way that I see it for me, my blood sugar, again, is normal for a non diabetic. Right. That's something that my dad, who's 18 months ahead of me on a type 2 diabetes journey, hasn't gotten to yet. Right. Because he didn't adopt the way of eating he's doing what the doctor told him, which is change the way you eat a little bit, focus on, you know, carb choices, take your medicine, and those kinds of things. And that's great, but it's treatment, and it's treatment for life. Yeah, and I will say, like, you're a much more pleasant person. Than, than you were, uh, I mean, the Never Bittner stuff started in April of 2016 yeah. because you were mostly intolerable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and it's not to be a dick to you, it's just you were, I think you were just so, f like the diabetes and your blood sugar had you just so wrecked in, yeah. in every area of your life that you were just like... And here's the sad part. It was like, the based on um, the... Uh, the issues that I've had with uh, my blood vessels and my eyes and in other places, the damage that has taken place, we think it could be as long as four years that my sugar's out of control. Hmm. So that means going back to 2012. Right. So that means a lot of people that I encountered from 2012 to 2016, they're probably pretty never bitter. Yeah. And I could think of specific instances looking back where I'm like, wow, was that really me? And a lot of it had to do with how I, I yeah. didn't realize that I was feeling terrible and that I was taking it out on other people. Right. Now, looking back, I see that. Yeah. And, and I see, wow, that's not the person that I believe I am. And so I, I see myself differently now than I did a year ago, for sure. Yeah, and, and so it is. It's a, it's a massive change. Real proud of you, and I'm I'm happy for you, and hopefully, you know, people will will get some ins inspiration from your story. It's it's certainly doable. I mean, I have made a uh, not a one eight. I made a one twenty five, not okay. a one eighty in my in my health this year, and it's been great. And it's and it's uh, I still have, but for me, it's always like you're you you've just gone full bore, and you haven't. Maybe you've had steps back, but like for me, it's always two steps forward, one step back, and everything I do, it takes me. A long time to get things, and then I kind of like go, oh, okay. And you know, you I have to have those moments where you know they're fewer and far between, but where I have those moments, like the last couple months, where I'm just like, oh, I feel horrible because I'm not working out enough and I'm right. eating crap. Yeah. Okay, time to stop going to stacked pickle and to get back on on the uh, the leafy green. So, um, I know you got to go, so we're gonna start wrapping up. I'm gonna let Brett. Uh, do his final thoughts. Thank you so much for uh, spreading the gospel of keto. I try my best. And if people want to want to listen, you can't outrun your fork. Is uh, excuse me, uh, Brett's podcast. Uh, I really didn't intend to belch on the microphone, but th that just was like uh, Jesus. That was like the Zapruder film. It was just right, right out of nowhere. Um, uh, you can't outrun the fork. You can send Brett questions. You can uh, add him there, and uh, I'm sure he'd love to have a conversation with you if you are keto curious. Is there one book out there or a podcast other than yours or a resource or something? That, there like, are actually tons of resources right. out there. The, but, like, the, what's the one that meant the most to you? Like, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger for me was the one that really got me into lifting. Yeah. So the thing that was probably it is probably the best resource for me is dietdoctor.com. Okay. Um, he's a Scandinavian doctor. Where he, this is how they treat diabetes in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Nothing but meatballs. Not exactly. <laughs> More fish and, and different fats. But essentially, he, he's got a nice two-week challenge to just ease you into it, to get you started. Um, there are tons of resources on there. They just started a video series for uh, cooking different items. Uh, they've got a lot of fantastic things with regard to that. And then Dr. Jason Fung is the one who helped me focus on the intermittent fasting ap aspect mm -hmm. of things. Um, and he's doing a lot of stuff with the diet doctor now, too. So the two of them together have really done a lot. And I share a lot of their content um, okay. on our Facebook page. 
Um, I try a lot of the recipes and share that. That's where I got the keto pizza. It's where I did keto fried chicken. Uh, I don't remember what keto thing we're cooking this weekend uh, when I'm in Cincinnati, but I'm sure, I think it's the soup, um, the broccoli, cheese, and cauliflower soup that looked awesome um, that they were promoting earlier this week, and, and I think that's what Morgan and I are going to make this Sunday. That seems to be the day that we kind of do that stuff. So um, those are things from – for me, that were very helpful, and I try to share that kind of stuff yeah. on the Facebook page, on Instagram. Um, it's the things that I talk about on the show, and, and it's can'toutrunthefork.com. You can def- I definitely suggest that you like us on Facebook at You Can't Outrun the Fork. Uh, Instagram is the same. Uh, we're also on Twitter, but it's much shorter. It's Can't Outrun Fork because you know, only have so many letters. Um, and if you have questions or an idea uh, for a guest or just – basically want to be heard or bounce something off of us, um, send send those to show at can'toutrunthefork.com. All right, cool. Brian, your final thoughts for this episode? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if uh, Bittner's looking for a guest for uh, can'toutrunthefork.com, give me a holla because I've been pretty uh, comfortable with the uh, keto <laughs> Throughout Gladly. my life, too, and uh, I think it'd be great to, to collaborate with you guys and have a lot of fun there. But, um, there's, there's you know, no going forward, obviously. Uh, go ahead. I said there's keto curious, then there's keto comfortable, and then there's then there's what keto crazy. That's keto you, crazy. There keto you crazy. Go. Yeah, sure. I'll take it. Hey, you know what? I if, if it's crazy <laughs> to feel this good, and you're, you're amazed how good you feel, exactly. That's exactly right. If if it's crazy to feel this good, then I don't want to be sane. All right, muffins, we're going keto. She's not enthused. Uh, no one's <laughs> enthused. Typical woman. All right, uh, go but ahead. No, my, go ahead. My, my my final thoughts. Um, I would say like uh, the 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 one thing that's kind of like uh, irking me this week, it's uh, this whole Trump dossier thing that's going on. Um, not sure if people have been paying attention to that, but. Uh, Basically, like you have uh, all these uh, news outlets who are now finally reporting that the uh, Trump dossier that was reported back in January of 2017 on um, that like was the whole you know pe- Trump peeing on people and stuff. Whatever it was, it was nuts. Um, that was actually funded by Hillary Clinton and uh, the DNC, uh, which is I think hilarious that yeah, they're finally caught up in this kind of stuff. And she's saying that she didn't have any idea. Um, but I mean the the whole thing it's it's uh, it's a bunch of, of I think honestly it's a bunch of speculation and uh, it's it's uh, up in the air in terms of the credibility of any of it a lot of it has been disproven um, but it just I love watching the uh, the 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 Make America Great Again crowd uh, crowd my uh, my timeline who are suddenly saying that uh, Russian collusion is real and it's 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 uh, not Trump's fault it's Hillary's fault. So uh, I, I just I, I think the uh, inconsistency there is uh, hilarious. But I mean, otherwise, you know, uh, looking forward to a week, hopefully, of uh, some good news. You know, feel free to follow me on Twitter um, at B Nichols Liberty, B N I C H O L S Liberty. Um, and then, uh, as Chris and I kind of elaborated at the beginning of the show, some some big news coming here forward in a little bit. Uh, it's on a DL right now, but just uh, keep your eyes open. All right, cool. For my final thought, yeah, it's interesting to see all of that. Uh, the, the Tony Podesta is being investigated. The Uranium One deals being investigated. Uh, there's some of this. Some of this stuff is starting to turn back around on the Democrats. But four hundred million dollar contract awarded in Puerto Rico. Don't uh, to- order an extra cheesy pizza. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so in Puerto Rico, uh, a close donor to Donald Trump was awarded uh, an energy contract in Puerto Rico. We posted it up on our We Are Libertarians Facebook page. You can check that out. There's little stuff like that where it just never stops. But um, uh, I wanted to take a point of personal privilege, and I want to direct you to the bonus episode of this week, which is already up for Patreon subscribers uh, and it is just me talking directly to you. And I want to say, uh, in case you're not a subscriber, you can at WeAreLibertarians.com. Join the Patreon. $5 and up a month. And uh, there's various levels and rewards that you can join in. Thank you to... Um, 
uh, thank you to them for supporting us. And you guys help independent media outlet, and hopefully you learned a lot in the show, and, and you're getting a lot out of it. Uh, I, I have been – it obviously, it's been a weird, uh, strange, tough couple weeks in a lot of different areas of my life, uh, some of which you have heard about. And uh, by opening up and sharing that with you – I cannot tell you how much the response privately from you guys has meant to me, and publicly, too. Uh, I have had dozens, and that's not even an exaggeration, and I love to exaggerate, but I'm not exaggerating in this case. Dozens of notes, uh, <laughs> messages, emails, tweets, face I mean, just Twitter, Instagram, all of it. You guys have just uh, written into me and said how much this means to you what we're doing here, how much uh, it has, uh, how much you get out of it, how much you're going to keep supporting this show. And all of that means a tremendous amount of me uh, to me, and that has meant um, a, uh, a – I talk about it at length in the bonus episode. I want to kind of just give you the truncated version here, uh, the TLDR version. First, thank you for those letters. And if I wrote you back, I tried to write everybody back. If I wrote you back and I, I didn't, if I seemed uh, busy or, or or unappreciative in any way, I don't want you to think that. I just genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, thank the audience for being supportive through this period of time. Um, and uh, the amount of notes have just been – there's been a lot. And uh, one person said that I am an inspiration and I am somebody that they look up to. And uh, I would laugh at that, and you want to laugh at that. And I do. I was actually morning. wondering if you were making it up. I'm not, and this person was not, and it kind of really started to get me to think about uh, where We Are Libertarians has been for the last couple years and where I want to take it and my personal values, and is the show reflecting my personal values? Is the show something that you – I can sit here and bash Donald Trump for talking in a way that you wouldn't talk to an 8-year-old, but am I putting out a product that – And that doesn't necessarily reflect yep. um, my personal values, and I kind of dive into that and talk a little bit about the changes that are coming to We Are Libertarians, and, uh, and apologies, public apologies abound. So if you haven't listened to it yet, please get the bonus show. Uh, there's, there's just 25 minutes of me just uh, talking a little bit about this, and I just want to say I want to thank you uh, for the relationship that we're building uh, I joked all the time that I am the audience and the audience is me. But I really feel like this audience, because you're reaching out and we're having daily conversations with – I'm having daily conversations with different people. I really am starting to feel a connection to this audience that is very special, and I want to thank you for that because it it uh, it has gone from being a fun hobby that we do to entertain ourselves and to have fun and hang out with each other to something a little bit bigger, and uh, that's really awesome, and I want to thank you for that and also uh, just – just apologize that sometimes this show has been a little too crass and this show has been a little too crude. And uh, I explain why and what was the philosophy behind some of that. And I don't think we're going to do much of that anymore. I don't think you're going to miss it's. It's not like we're not going to be authentic and we're not going to talk about our lives. I mean, just had a, a conversation about Brett's life and an insight into him. And I made a couple dirty jokes, but at the end of the day, I don't think you're really going to miss me saying the C word on this podcast. I just don't think that that's, a reflection of who I am as a person, and uh, I want you to go listen to that. Um, I'm putting it behind the paywall because it's just a little – it's personal, and I'd rather it stay with the people who are really invested in this. Uh, so thank you, guys. Thank you for being here, Brett. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate you having me on. I appreciate it. Brian, thank you for being here. I know you had something to say, and I, tr I uh, cut you off. No, I'll, I'll end it like this. I had a friend – um, a very dear friend who who is uh, very in in the woods with uh, with their affiliations, both in terms of looking at neocon, but also the establishment GOP, and they're just looking for direction. And uh, I talked to them personally, and I said, you know what, I have a podcast. I want you to listen to. It's called We Are Libertarians. Just just listen to like five episodes. Just just listen to it at the gym, when you're you know doing homework, whatever it is. Just just listen to it and just try to. Listen to what the the different point of view is, and uh, after their, I, I gave them a five episode challenge, and after their five episodes, they uh, they came back to me and said, you know what, 
um, I'm sold. And uh, for me, that was huge because uh, it speaks to the volume that uh, We Are Libertarians has in terms of reaching out and helping change some minds. Uh, but at the same point in time, uh, it really adds credibility to what we're trying to accomplish as a uh, movement for those in the GOP, in the LP, who are all focused on trying to accomplish a, liber- a liberty goal going forward. So, uh, you know, Chris, I thank you for for starting a uh, a movement here in the, the We Are Libertarians empire that can really, it touches minds, it touches hearts, and, and it does change minds. Um, so, you know, for that, I say thank you. Um, I, I think we have a lot of good things going forward. And that, and that's really what, I, what long story short, I want to focus on. I want to focus on creating libertarians and informing existing libertarians and less on the hijinks and more on the information. And I think that's really where I'm headed with this. And I think... Uh, it has nothing to do with anybody departing. In fact, to be quite honest, uh, Greg was somebody who was always like, can we just focus on the policy? I mean, so it was all my decision, and I, I lay all that out, and I want you guys to, to hear that. And I thank you for that, Brian, and I think that's really interesting. I think a five-episode challenge, they get to pick the topic, they get to go back and listen, and then see what they think, and I think that you should try that. Uh, try a, a five-episode challenge with We Are Libertarians. We've got a big... Uh, library if there's topics that we ought to cover let me know but uh yeah i think that uh that's that's a really great idea and thank you brian for that and thank you brian for appearing on the show absolutely i mean i'm i'm excited for uh where we are libertarians is going um i'm excited to to see uh, you know going forward how i can help out um but more more importantly i'm excited to see how you know just with my one personal experience even though it's anecdotal like to see we are libertarians is actually having an impact in in actually helping not only change people's minds but like helping them uh, understand why they're changing their minds. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm very excited and uh, Chris, you know, more than happy to help out anyway going forward. All right, cool. And you'll hear more, Brian. And uh, if you have a story like that, that anecdotal evidence, please post it on your Facebook, share it with your friends, and say, hey, just listen to five episodes of these guys and see what you think. And I will continue to pump out the content. I will continue to bring in smart people who believe a lot of cool things. And until then, I, I, I appreciate Joey Tarner in the uh, in the Dear Leaders Court. Special shout out to him. And uh, I uh, just want to say, hey, keep your prayers going for Phyllis Klosinski as she's dealing with her cancer battle. And until next time, be good to each other. All right. Cool. Thank you for staying.